good. Okay, so this is for the future youngsters, huh? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I think um, the first thing we want to talk about, maybe the part one, I will go right here. The one is about the intro to the X-ray instrument um, that we have downstairs. X-ray instrument. All right. So we want to start with uh, why we are using X-ray and why uh, it is helpful. So uh, basically, the idea is if you think about all the instruments that is on the market that um, has any correlation with the light, uh, it is basically using a part of the um, light spectrum. And X-ray is one of that. So in the, pr in the uh, spectrum of, of light, we always have visible range, which is very, very narrow. It's around uh, 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength. And uh, above that, you got a view wave base. And uh, uh, below that, you got a view wave base. Above that, you got IR and microwave, something like that. So X ray is actually hitting in be below UV base. And the wavelength of X ray typically is around 0 0.01 to 100 angstroms. So typically, for the lab based uh, X ray, we use a wavelength from 0.5 to 2.5 angstrom. And our tool, using copper as the X-ray source, we have 1.54 angstrom in there. So if we compare um, the wavelength of X-ray versus the visible, which is 500 nanometers, you can see the difference um, what we can use X-ray to do uh, when compared with the visible. So we all know light, light scattering. And light scattering only is able to measure some big particles, which is the, uh, the particle size is actually on the same order of the wavelength of the UV visible light. And X-ray, because this number is very close to the interatomic distance, that is why we always use that to um, unentangle or uh, to investigate the atomic level um, polymer structures. So the history of X-ray starts all the way from metals which is, has a very, very crystalline structure all the way to the soft materials like polymers. And uh, we are using X-ray to look at uh, some mostly the crystalline structure in the polymers. So I would say the second part is application. Mm -hmm. Mostly polymer structure has amorphous or um, crystalline. For amorphous structure, there is no order inside, so that uh, when it scatters, the atoms, is going, the electrons, is going to be very sparse. It's going to be um, dispersed in a very random way, and it will give us um, scattering everywhere. We cannot understand anything from that. But if we have crystalline structure, for example, for a very simple uh, lamella structure, we have um, polymer layers by layers, and in between, we have air, air. So now, since I talked about uh, X-ray, look at at uh, atomic level, atoms. So uh, actually, X-ray is very sensitive to, or it, it um, will recognize um, electrons inside of a polymer. So uh, what happens um, is X-ray, when it shoots on an atom, it will be scattered around, I mean, actually, electron. It will be scattered around. And depending on how many, how many electrons you have there, you can get different intensities of, of X-rays. But if you've got um, different intensity of X-rays, it still doesn't give you much information unless you have electron density um, difference between two materials or um, as long as it's like two different matters that have different electron density difference, you will have enough uh, contrast. We call electron density difference as contrast. So contrast is the only thing you need to consider about when you have a new sample. And if there's no contrast, you do not have any uh, real information or uh, information you can understand. Um, for example, for amorphous polymers, there's no electron density difference in there. But for crystalline structure, you have polymer air, polymer air. Since the composition of these two substances are different, on the surface, 
of uh, air and polymer interface, you can have um, scattering from there or recognizable by the detector. And in our group, we specifically worry about uh, three main applications. The first one, as I talked about right there, uh, is a bulk solid sample. For a bulk solid sample, typically we use a transmission method. Um, basically, we have X-ray produced and shined on a bulk sample, which is perpendicular to the X-ray direction. And now we have scattering and to the detector. So now if you think about how X-ray is transpassed the polymer sample, it actually transpassed along the thickness direction, which means when it interacts with all the electrons, it interacts with the uh, volume uh, of the polymer that the X-ray is illuminated is basically equal to the area of the X-ray beam times the thickness of your, um, of your sample itself. So if your sample is pretty thick, you have enough illuminated volume or scattering volume right there, you can have enough electron, um, uh, you know, enough photon to be scattered and being collected. Um, typically for a bulk sample, we want one to two millimeter thickness, which will provide enough um, inform information. So the second one is still solid sample, but uh, it is going to be a solid thin film sample. Or we call this kind of experiments as GIXD, uh, which means Grazy Incidence X-ray Diffraction. So in this case, we have X-ray coming, but now the sample is now um, perpendicular to that. We actually have a very thin film, thin film sample and we are going to have a substrate underneath of that. So the idea is that if we actually use the same geometry here, use transmission geometry, the thin film is too thin, the thickness is too low, so the scattered, uh, scattering volume is so low, and we do not have enough data to be collected on the detector. However, if now we give it a, a, diff a small um, angle between X-ray and the thin film, what now, what X -ray, when the X-ray interacts with the thin film, it will, the scattering volume is not just going to be a, um, the, uh, air, the um, uh, air cross section area of X-ray, it actually interacts with the entire length of the sample. So with L inside of the, vol of the scattering volume, you can have much stronger X-ray scattering um, intensity. That is why we use GI, um, GI mode. So people call it actually as a reflection mode. And this is um, transmission mode. All right, so now these two are the solid samples. So what about solution samples? Specifically, the solution X-ray that we run in our lab needs to be very dilute solution. And why dilute solution? Because in the solution phase, typically there's no ordered, ordered structure in there because it's not like very nicely packed or something like that. So now, in for a solution X-ray sample, we have a capillary and a solution in there. And specifically in this case, we have two components inside of this capillary. We have polymer chains and we have solvent. Now, if you think about if you only run a pristine solvent sample, what happens is like there's no order in there. The electron density is now is, um, all the way the same from one point to another point. Now, if you scatter, it is going to be a very, very uh, random scattering. You do not have inf any information in there. However, when you have a polymer chain in there, because of the poly polymer chain geometry is kind of different, now on top of that, scattering of the solvent, you have scattering from, so from the solute. And the solute is going to give you a specific pattern of scattering that you can deconvolute uh, the information of the chain geometry from that pattern. And in this case, the X-ray is shooting inside of um, the capillary and produce um, a scattering signal. 
Um, but this case is going to be more complicated than running a solid sample because under this case, you have three um, different origins for the scattering signal. The first of all, it is capillary itself. And in our lab, we always use two millimeter diameter capillary tube to provide um, to use um, to, pro to provide pro provide support for the solution. Second part is the solvent itself. In in our lab, we only use water or hydrocarbon solvents. Hydro hydrocarbon solvents. And the reason why we do not use because with the reason why we do not use any heavy items inside of uh, the solvents is because the heavy atoms is going to have a very high absorption of X-ray. Typically, a chloroform is going to ruin, um, I mean, it's going to absorb most of the X-ray, and it does not provide enough X-ray to be uh, scattered from the sample itself. And the third part is the sample, or the salute. So what's the best concentration for a solution X-ray sample? Actually, it depends on the sample itself. Typically, for example, for polystyrene, we would like to have like five mix per mil to give us enough scattering intensity. So we can st uh, always start from five mix per mil and uh, see if the scattering is good or not. If it's good, we can down, uh, downgrade that. D I mean, we can uh, make it a lower. If it's not good, we can increase a, li a little bit. But we do not want it to be too thick or too thin. So that is um, mostly about the um, tool or the applications of the X-ray in our lab. So how does um, X-ray interact with the material? Question one and question two is, what's the difference between one, two, three? And can you explain the difference uh, between scattering and diffraction? Yes. Um, OK, I'm going to wipe this up now. Um, so th for the first part, I'm going to leave it when I talk about instrument, about interaction between X-ray and sample. So for the second part, you're asking about how uh, what's the difference between these three in terms of, um, in terms of what? I'm sorry. Look, ask my question again. I agree with him. <laughs> you yeah. said in terms of one, two, and three, which are uh, bulk state, GXD, and the solution. Daniel, can you repeat my question? Uh, what was the difference between those three? No. <laughs> That's all I heard. Yeah. I think you guys, in the, it's, it's, it's a quite a difficult <coughs> question. My question is, among three techniques mm -hmm. we do, which one is scattering, which one oh, is diffraction? Diff oh, difference between scattering and diffraction. OK, um, so uh, the idea is um, to differentiate the, actually, the concept between scattering and diffraction. I would say the easy way to uh, differentiate that is saying diffraction belongs to scattering, but it's a special kind of scattering. So scattering is basically now if you are playing bowling, if you throw a white ball into like nine balls here, and it will scatter around without any different order, without any um, a predictable um, path of, of where it, it goes to. Um, and also the um, uh, energy difference between before and after scattering, uh, before and after scattering is very hard to predict as well. So however, for diffraction, it's a very specific type of scattering, which is that it follows some, 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 some order. So it's basically if there is ordered structure in your, um, let, let's say, if there is ordered structure in the target sample, and you have elastic scattering, and we would call that as diffraction. Is that correct? Mm, kind of. Diffraction is a 
quite a special case where you look like atomic ordering right crystal in the name mm -hmm. historically people use it specifically look at crystal in the name structure yeah, that's how people um, define the term as diffraction. But now it's kind of mixed at some point. Yeah. OK. So, right. yeah, Good. after this one, let's talk about the um, instrument uh, itself. So, let me wipe this away. So, those are quite fundamentals how we deal with the samples, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So now talking about the tool that we use um, downstairs, um, actually it's very uh, easy to understand if you think yourself as X-ray itself. Now you need to be born, right? You have X-ray source. <laughs> X-ray source is going to provide you X-ray, and you want your own sample in there. Let's say this is sample chamber. It has to hit on the chamber so that it interact with your sample and produce X-ray scattering, um, and, and produce a scattered X-ray, and you want to detect it using a big detector. You want to trap all these photons uh, using a detector. So these are most fundamentally three, um, three parts that, that you need to use. So uh, X-ray source, we people typically use have two kinds. The <laughs> first one is called a um, X-ray tube. Typically, this one is made of metals. For example, copper, molybdenum, molybdenum. I forgot what's the name of, the, of it. <laughs> yeah, for copper specifically, um, that, is what, that is what we use, and we have um, certain <laughs> wavelength that it pr provides us. And the other source is a synchrotron source. This is why synchrotron. Synchrotron source, yeah, we always write proposals to this kind of facility. The, in the uh, flux of X-ray that was produced by synchrotron is typically um, around like millions, uh, like a million times of the um, X-ray tube itself. So that's why the um, measurement time in the synchrotron is much less than using a lab-based X-ray source. So if you produce extra source through metals, you will have like a uh, very random X-ray when you hit on the, I mean, you, if you use electrons um, to hit on the metal, the X-ray is going to be very, very random. So now if you want to uh, let that X-ray to hit your sample, you will not get uh, very, very nice information because they are not very collimated. So we, what we want is very parallel and collimated X-ray to shine on our sample. Mm -hmm. That's why between the source and chamber, we need collimation tubes. Collimation tubes is composed of a very nice crystals or mirrors that allow that different orientation of X-ray to go through one direction and to narrow the uh, convergence and make it very, very small. Make it small and intense, that is, what the collimation tube does. When it hits on your sample chamber, the X-ray is going to interact with your matter. And typically, there are three interactions between X-ray and your sample. The first one is absorption. Since X-ray is simply, um, you can see that as a photon, uh, when a photon hit on your electron, an electron might uh, okay, get, gain some energy. Basically, it means it absorbed energy from the photon. So that is absorption. The second one is transmission. Because if you think about atomic structure, an electron inside of a, an atom is basically like an ant inside of the polymer, polymer science building. So they are like more than 99% of 99% of space that the uh, neutron is not going to hit the um, electron. So transmission is takes the majority. Yeah. When you speak neutrons, it only in neutrons. Not okay, yeah. Nuclei. Yeah, not not neutrons. My bad. In X-ray, it's only interacting with, with electrons. Way. Exactly. So yeah. So the electron takes only a very small percent inside of the space of an atom. That's why most of the photon 
was not interacted with electrons, and it simply transmitted the sample and hit on the detector. So the third uh, interaction is called scattering. And this happens is there is a chance like one in a million incident photon hit on your, on your electron and was scattered by the electron. And by the mechanism of scattering, you have elastic scattering and inelastic scattering. And elastic scattering is basically means that the incident uh, neutron, incident a photon wavelength is equal to after it was scattered. So lambda in is equal, equal to lambda out. While the inelastic scattering, the incident uh, wavelength is different from the out wavelength. And specifically, for uh, in order to look at uh, order the structure, we only care about elastic scattering for um, for, for X rays. Or this is called Thom Thompson scattering. This is called Compton scattering. Okay, now after the X ray was scattered uh, to uh, scattered by the sample, it will be shined on the detector and be collected about it uh, on the detector. So since we already talked about the transmission takes, the transmitted x-ray is much more than the scattering signal. So there's a very strong beam of x-ray shined directly on the, on the detector. However, depending on the quality of the de detector, the read-in and read-out rate of the photon is different. So we actually want, actually do not want too much photons to be hit on the detector at one time. That's why typically we will have a beam stop to block all the transmission of X-ray and only allow a detector to detect the transmitted, uh, the, the scattered phot uh, photons. And also depending on your sample to detector distance, you can change the geometry of your uh, experiment. So for the uh, sample to detector distance, we typically use um, three geometries. So the first one we call, it is called wax. So the wax basically means wide angle X-ray scattering. And what is this angle mean? So what is this angle actually? So this angle is basically the angle between your incident X-ray, incident X-ray, and your uh, scattered X-ray. This is the angle we call it two theta. So if this theta two theta is large, we call it a wide angle. If it's two theta is low, we call it a, a small angle scattering. So now if we imagine the detector is right here, or the de de sample two detector distance is very small. Now the, um, the data that the detector can collect can be at a much higher data values. Mm -hmm. So which means for wax, we have a very low, sample, uh, very small uh, sample to detector distance. And on in the opposite way, SACS or small angle extra scattering, we have a big or, or longer sample to detector distance. Uh, for wide, wide angle extra scattering, um, we do have different options. For example, 150 millimeters is typically what we use for um, the uh, wax experiment. So specifically for this geometry, there is a Q value or Q range we can detect. It's mostly from 0 0.12 angstrom to a power of minus 1 all the way to 2.2 angstrom to the power of minus 1. Mm -hmm. And for the sacs, we typically use 2,500 millimeters or 2.5 meters. That is going to give us a Q range of 0 0.004 angstrom to the power of minus 1 to 0 0.2, around 0 0.2 angstrom to the power of minus 1. If you want to transfer this Q value or Q range into D range or real space, real, li uh, real um, uh, life, D, uh, dispersing 
you can simply use d is equal to 2 pi over q to calculate that. Um, and wax in actually include g wax, both transmission and reflection mode. Yeah, so I think that is most of the basics. And what is, uh, what is next? Yeah. yeah we, can, we can take a break and ask a few questions. So any question about on Mentos interaction so far? Could you explain the importance of introducing a vacuum to the sample cham chamber? Yes. So importance um, of the vacuum, um, if you think about the difference between vacuum and ambient, the simply uh, what's the difference is air, right? It's only if there's air or there's no air. So uh, for air, um, w if you think about the composition of air, you have oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, any kinds of um, stuff in there. So each single element has electron in there. As long as there is electron, there's absorption, there's scattering. So what the air does to the system is it absorbs too much that we do not have uh, enough uh, X-ray to interact with our sample or even the scattered, scattered x-ray can be absorbed by air itself as well. And in the meantime, the air can provide a certain amount of scattering signal that creates some background in your, on your detector. When you were talking about the contrast, mm -hmm. you made it seem like the air and uh, the electrons was enough contrast. That's the contrast you were looking for. But mm -hmm. <coughs> it sounded like you were saying that it has to, in crystalline you have these layers of air. Mm -hmm. Why would that not be the case in something like a gas where you have large areas of air in between? I know that there's less order, but I mean in a gas. I mean there's still contrast <coughs> in a gas. But yeah. Oh yeah, there's contrast in a gas, but there's no ordering in a gas because it's everything is random. It's like <coughs> combination of random uh, composition every every different point. So is there an example of something which wouldn't have contrast? Wouldn't have contrast, you mean? Um, everything's made up of 99% air. Oh, if it's made if it, you mean hydrogel, maybe. Uh, uh, or air gel. So the question from Daniel, the, so the first part, uh, he asked, uh, it seems like contrast is universal because you always have air and electrons. Right? Oh, so got you. Yeah. Not always the case. Mm -hmm. You have a solution sample, then you don't have, you know, air in between. But once you have air, you indeed have local contrast difference. The second question is, if w those scattered, mm -hmm. um, scattered photons would interfere with mm -hmm. each other to create a sort of pattern, if there is no correlation in your electron density difference, then what you get is basically a uniform background. So you will scatter, like you see, your detector will pick up neutrons or photons, but it's random. There is no correlation in terms of distance, or, or it, or it just uh, didn't have any meaning in the diffracted data. Yeah, as long as you have electron density, as long as you have that interface, it will always scatter. But uh, when it comes to detector, it might be, okay, scatters so randomly that detector pick up as a uh, amorphous ring. I'm not. Even not a ring, but just like pristine, uh, equal intensity at each different position. Yeah. yeah. So, so, are you comfortable speaking about original scattering and atomic scattering factor yeah, versus sure. uh, molecular scattering factor, and discuss about the intensity of the scattering with respect to the form factor and structure factor? Um, uh, yeah, I can try to, but I don't have the math equation with me. It's okay, you can describe <coughs> the concept briefly, but yeah. any, wait, wait, any question for now, for these parts? We haven't really finished oh. all of it. You need to dif discuss a bit more about instruments in mm -hmm. terms of slits. Yes. <coughs> and which part we would usually play. Right. And slits and slits. Flux. Exactly. Before we talk about the, the fundamentals, okay. Got gotcha. um, you. Okay, for the slits. So the slits is um, installed on the collimation tube since um, 
you do not just have crystals uh, to uh, help you to align the X-ray. You also have slits to help you narrow down the size of X-ray. And um, in our system, we have two sets of slits, both in the vertical direction and x-axis direction. So each single one, we have um, one, two, three, four, four sets of slits. So we call it slits one and slit two. What do they do? Yeah. So slit is basically to help you to under, um, to, um, uh, what's that word? To um, <laughs> truncate to truncate the x -ray, the x rays that are not parallel or that is not uh, so parallel that uh, it will hit on the edge of the slits and do not come out. So this helps to collimate the beam or decrease the convergence of the beam. Um, and uh, for typically we have well, three modes of slit size that um, we typically use, or the X-ray machine it sets itself. So the modes of slits can be actually four. The modes of slits mm -hmm. can be subdivided into four open, which means the entire X-ray beam is going to come out, which we use a eight uh, millimeter by eight millimeter size of the slits. So it's already set in the software. The second one is called high flux. In this case, it is 1.2 by 1.2 millimeter size. And third one is called high resolution. It's actually 0 0.7 by 0 0.7 millimeters. So why do we control um, this different size of the slits? Um, that depends on our specific uh, applications. So typically, for open, we normally do not use that because the beam is so big and our sample typically is not that big. And secondly, um, for the high flux one, we typically use for wax, bulk sample. Because for powder sample, our sample holder has a very small, um, small hole uh, in there, which is very similar to the size of the beam size. That's typically what we use. And for the highest resolution, 0.7 by 0.7, typically we do not need to use that, except if we have uh, like a capillary tube that uh, has 